Shalom Aleichem, Erev Tov. We are continuing in our shiur from last night. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shakon Miyavro. The Gemara tells us, Amaru, that day, Oto Hayom, that same day, Hiviu kol taharot shetiher Rabbi Eliezer, Usrafum Ba'esh. They brought all of the taharot, all of the things that Rabbi Eliezer had declared pure. Bava Metziah, page 59b, section 6. All of the taharot, all of the things that Rabbi Eliezer had declared to be pure, they burned them. Venimnu alav, and they gathered together. Uvirchuhu, nimnu, it's an interesting word here. Gathered together is not the right word. We're going to see what nimnu really means in the context of this Sanhedrin, which is a nude. Nimnu literally means they took a vote. They counted. They took a vote among themselves and they ostracized Rabbi Eliezer from the Sanhedrin in the Bet Midrash. Uvirchuhu. It's interesting the word ostracize. Birchuhu, they blessed him. This could either be another meaning of the word blessed or also just a way that a rabbi speaks in a language that is says one thing while really meaning another thing. We have other examples of this. Vamru, now they reached a problem. What's the problem? Now that Rabbi Eliezer, the colleague, the rabbi, some of them their teacher, they've now sent him out of the world of the Ben Amidash. It seems that Rabbi Eliezer is no longer there at the point of this consensus. He had left for the day, whatever it was. He had gone back to Lud. And at this point in time, they need to figure out the dilemma. Vamru, mi elech v'yodiyo. Who is going to go and tell him? If randomly my words are slightly different than yours, I'm reading out of, uh, prefer often the text of the Enyakov to the text of the Vilna Talmud that is in front of you. Uh, but likely we're all the same. It's good to have different translations. Yes. Amar lehem Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva tells them, Ani elech. I'm going to go tell him. I'm the student of Rabbi Eliezer. Let me go and break the news to my rabbi that he has been excommunicated. Because maybe somebody who's not fitting for the job, a student who, who is not the proper person to go, and he will tell him, Rabbi Eliezer, the news in a wrong way. And he would cause the entire world to be destroyed. They have to now excommunicate a man who they believe to tr- possess tremendous spiritual powers. And he's telling him, let me go. I know how to break the news. You know, I feel in the story, it reminds me of a moment in my history when I was living in Israel, in Yerushalayim, and I was learning by Rav Peretz. She lived in Liwa. And Rav Peretz's friend, for many years, Chacham Mordechai Eliyahu, the late chief rabbi, far chief rabbi of Israel, passed away. And the question of the Bermidash is, who's going to go tell him? And I, everyone, nobody wants to bring bad news. Especially since Arab Peretz is very particular not to bring bad news. There's a halakha in Shulchan Aruch. You might not like this halakha, but you're not supposed to tell somebody that somebody else has died. I know that everyone does it. That just because everyone does it doesn't mean it's right. In Arab Peretz's family, for many years, there was a sibling who didn't know that one of the other siblings died. No need. Now you think, no need, it sounds... When you understand the mentality of halakha here, throwing a person into a shiva, maybe someone who's not well enough to handle a shiva, there's calculations that have to be made in these regards. It's not about hiding the truth. We don't want to be the bringers of bad news. Everyone says it, good, so let somebody else bring the bad news. You you know, very often, when someone passes away, and I have an obligation as the rabbi of the kila to send out an email, I always wait. I'm always almost the last person. I want the whole world to know I shouldn't be the one telling anybody. And for other people, oh, why are you not the first one? I don't want to be. I don't want to be the... I'll be very happy to send you a Chag Zameach email. But Baruch Dayan Ha'emet email, I don't want to be the one to do that. So, after I saw who was volunteering to go, I told them, Chavon, let me go. I, I know, I know that all of you are going to speak to Arab Peretz, and you're going to say something so ridiculous. Let me just go and I'll break the news. And I went. And in my way, I let Harab Peretz know something wasn't okay. He understood already. And he collapsed in front of me. His knees buckled down, and we caught him. And he said, 
was naim. That was the word he gave him. Was a pleasant man. He made the Jewish people love Judaism. He said it was fitting the title they gave him, Avihem Shel Israel, the father of the Jewish people. He really had that character trait. He shared with us a few things privately about Chamor Gadiel. And Rabbi Akiva here decides he's the one who's going to tell his rabbi the news because it's better he should break the bad news than somebody else should do it in an incorrect fashion. Ma'asa Rabbi Akiva. So what did Rabbi Akiva do? Lavash Shchorim. He wore black clothing. Who wears black clothing? Mourners. You don't wear, in Jewish tradition, it's not like what we have today. In Jewish tradition, you don't wear black unless something bad happens. Shabbat. The, the Mekubalim right? The Arizal says that somebody who wears black clothing on Shabbat is a Mechalel Shabbat. He's a desecrator of Shabbat, violator of Shabbat. Chamer Lechel, I was speaking about him. He said that in our generation, black is already in many circles considered a respectable color to wear. People don't see someone in a black suit and wonder who died in their family. And so it's almost today to respect people you dress in a black tie wedding, right? They'll tell you that. It's a certain type of dress, but leave that. In Jewish culture, you don't wear black unless there's mourning. Hava Peretz, by the way, never wears black. Ever. His, his jacket is always blue. Always. I'll tell you a private thing. I don't look so great in blue. I know right now we're in blue, but it's not my... Uh, I always wear, you'll see, I never wear... I wear on Shabbat at least. It's always gray. On purpose. Maybe you say gray is type of black. Fine, I'll give it to you. I'm not perfect. If we could all wear white, halavai. Halavai that we could do such a thing. <laughs> right. The problem is you, you start to re, you start to enable certain people's rumors and things like that, which is why for one day. Lavash Chorim. Rabbi Akiva wears black clothing. Venitatef Shechorim. And he wraps himself in black clothing. What does that mean? What does it mean, ituf? When a mourner sits shiva, they take off their leather shoes. They don't shower. They don't cut their nails. They don't cut their beard. They don't cut their hair. They sit on the floor. If not on the floor, then at least low on the ground. And they do ituf. What is ituf? It's in the Shukhan They wrap their bodies or their heads? They wrap their heads. There's a head wrap that is worn for Avelin. Now, you should, you should know. Yeah, you should know. Very good. Like we wrap a talit. The ituf, if you go to a Yemenite shiva, that's not, and you should never go, but if you happen to have been in a Yemenite shiva, you will see that those who still maintain Yemenite tradition, they have their head wrapped in a talit. That's a halakha. It's like everything else in the halakha. You can't skip this part. Very good. In Tisha B'Av, if you go to the Bera Knesset of Rabbi Dr. Ratzon Arusi, or an old school, not today's Yemenite, old school Yemenites, they wear a black talit on Tisha B'Av. It's black. From the top to the bottom, it's black. Like, like this that I'm wearing? It's black. Just once a year. On Tisha B'Av. But that's what it says. Rabbi Akiva wraps himself in black, meaning he changes even the ituf, the talit, or whatever scarf he wraps around his head, even that one is black. Like a mourner wears black. Nidui. It's a different type of excommunication. It's, uh, it's, uh, is there a halachic differentiation? Possibly. We'd have to look in the halachot of excommunications. and it's, yeah. He's not being excommunicated as a Jew from the Jewish people. Right. It's different. Nidui. We're going to discuss that a little bit because you see that people still speak with him afterwards. You know, Nidui is very similar. The word, when we say that a woman is a nida, that she's ritually impure. That's not the correct one. Nida literally means someone who is now in isolation. She's being isolated. She's no longer with her husband. She's not with her in the old world, especially. And he died. All kinds of things that didn't happen. They sit in the same chair, in the same bed. All kinds of things. Even the Rambam warred against many issues that people made out of Nida that were what he believed to be from the pagan world and not Jewish influences. But the term Nida, that's what we say We say in the Tehillah in the morning, Mondays and Thursdays, We feel like we're... Like, tameim like a nida. Oh, it's not such an evil thing. It's such a bad thing to say. Why do you make women who are nida feel bad? It's not the case. Here, nida, we feel isolated from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, like a woman who is a nida feels isolated from her husband. 
That's the feeling that we're feeling. So Nidui is that, say, they put him in Nidui. They place him in isolation. In the, today's world of quarantine, we might actually understand this concept more. If you didn't imagine a person in quarantine who didn't have a phone and didn't have an iPad and didn't have a laptop and didn't have a TV and didn't have, they were just in their room for 14 days. Lo and the beginning of COVID, there were many old people, many old people who were completely cut off. And I'm certain, by the way, today it's not the time. The world is still not in a place of healing to look back and discuss. But there's a pikuach nefesh involved in not allowing people to be isolated. Isolation is also a deadly disease. A person, there's a balance that had to be made here. And I, right now, like I told you, the world is not yet in a place to discuss. But, <clears throat> but I'm certain of that. I'm certain of that. We human beings are, are social creatures. That's what, even the most introverted among us is still a social creature. So what did Rabbi Akiva do? He wears black clothing. He wraps himself in black. And he sat down next to Rabbi Eliezer, but at a distance of four amot. Why is he separating himself four amot? Because he's in Nidui. When a person is in Nidui, we're not even allowed to walk close to them. And so he sits far away. Amar lo Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer looks at him and says, Akiva, ma yom yamim. In the Vilna edition, ma yom yomayim. It's the same phrase, but two different ways. And in modern Hebrew, we say ma yom yomayim. But here, ma yom yamim. Why is today different than any other day? Meaning, what's, what's going on with you? Amar lo, he says, Rabbi, Kim Dumeli, my rabbi, it, it appears to me that your colleagues, your friends, are distancing themselves from you. Now really he's including himself in this category. Rabbi Eliezer is no simpleton. He understands exactly what's happening. His student is wearing black, he's wrapped in black, he's sitting four amot away from him. Rabbi Eliezer is a man of halakha. He understands very clearly what's going on. your friends are separating themselves from you. He knows he's paying a price now for the opinion that he held in the Bede Midash. At that point, Rabbi Eliezer rips his clothing. Why does he rip his clothing? Yeah, it's a sign of mourning. By the way, in, in Jewish tradition, we rip our clothing quite often. It's not practiced. When we look at current Judaism and we look at real Judaism you very often wonder if they have anything to do with each other it's almost like you look at Christianity oh it's the long lost brother of Israel really long lost, it's very so long lost I can barely recognize what it is sometimes when you're reading through the Talmud and the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch and you look at Jewish practice on the street, you really wonder if we practice the same religion when a Talmud Chacham dies you rip your shirt any Talmud Chacham, but especially if it's a Talmud Chacham you learn Torah from when the Gdol Hado passes away, I, when Chacham of Adiyah passed away, I ripped my clothing. Yeah. People looked at me like, with the scissors, I ripped my hand. People thought I was crazy. I was crazy. This is, not only is this the, the, one of the greatest Chachamim of the generation, but it's somebody whose Torah I learn and I learn constantly. All of us have received something from it. How do you, know, how do you live in a Jewish world where someone passes away and we're just, we ignore it, we keep moving? Let's have a moment of silence. Why a moment of silence? We Jews have ways in with which we mourn. One of them is ripping our clothing. No, I will. I will. Because <laughs> they even the shirt they can't rip. I understand. V'chalat min alav, and he takes off his shoes like a mourner. V'nishmat v'yashav al gabe karka, and he goes out of his chair and he sits on the ground. Zalgu enav demaut. Rabbi Eliezer starts to cry. His literally tears pour out of his eyes. This is fascinating. And obviously it has to be interpreted through a Gothic lens that we cannot do today. The world, the physical world was damaged by the feelings that Rabbi Eliezer was feeling. Were feeling. Was feeling. Shalish bezetim, a third of the olives in the world were afflicted. Shalish bechitim, a third of the grains in the world, of the, the uh, wheat in the world, and a third of the barley in the world were afflicted. And some say, 
that even the dough that was in a woman's hands was spoiled. Why the dough in a woman's hands? Why not the dough in a woman's uh, mixing bowl? Why? Hechot Pesach. Think for me of Hechot Pesach. How long does it take from when water touches flour? How long does it take when water touches flour for the dough to become chametz? As long as she's kneading it, it doesn't become chametz. 18 minutes if you let it sit alone. But if you're kneading the dough, you can knead the dough the whole entire day and the dough is not considered chametz. Yeah, you know this, we, we practice this here in our matzah bakery. Yes, yes. So even the dough that a woman was kneading, meaning actively nothing should be happening to this dough, even that dough spoiled. Tana. We're taught. Af gadol haya b'oto ayom. There was a great af. What is af? V'chara af Adonai b'hem. Not you. B'hem. The anger of a Kadosh Baruch Hu flared up. Yes? Af. Larich apecha. We say Kadosh Baruch Hu is slow to anger. We, uh, if you look in certain Sephardic Sidoim, almost every time it says af, they change the word. So for example, if you look in a Moroccan Sidu, not of today, of yesterday, in the Shabbat prayers in Birkat Amazon, we add in Ratzeva Chalizenu. Ratzeva Chalizenu. It says there, af al pisha chanu even though we've eaten from your table and we've enjoyed the food, but we have not forgotten the destruction of your bed and bizar. There are many Sephardim that on Shabbat, they don't say that. And even though we ate, they don't want to use the word af, even though af in that context does not mean anger at all. It just means and. But they prefer not to use that word because not to speak about anger on Shabbat. At that moment, there was anger in the world. That every place Rabbi Eliezer looked at, Nisraf, that place burned. I want to pause here. Do you know what? Let's continue. We're in the Gemara. Why jump around? Let's continue here the story. You know, yesterday I was thinking if I should have taught this story more sensationally. If I had three hours yesterday, what I would have done is an hour, I would have told you the story from the perspective of Rabbi Eliezer, and you would have been angry. And then I would have explained to you the side of the Sanhedrin. But because I was afraid, look, there are people that were here yesterday that were not here now. And the people that are here now, maybe weren't here yesterday. The people that are listening online, listen to yesterday's class, won't listen to today's class. As I didn't want to leave anybody in a place of crisis. That's why I explained it. Already yesterday I started giving you answers for why the Sanhedrin did what they did and why they had to treat Rabbi Eliezer this way. But I ask at this moment, put yourself in the shoes of Rabbi Eliezer. He is broken. He's mourning. He's ripping his clothing. He's sitting on the floor. Everywhere he looks is destroyed. Again, Agadah. You read that in, in Agadah lives. He is not able at this point to, to overcome his emotions. Rabbi Akiva, his student, is mourning. It's a clever way that Rabbi Akiva broke the news to his rabbi. He didn't tell him much. He let him slowly. He realized something's wrong. Something, are you and he's sitting down? You're sitting down. It seems to me that your friends are separating yourself. And he understood the rest. I feel that's a no. Because there's a certain to let the, the news sink in. Yeah. In Israel, there's a similar. Shocking. Could kill a person on his own. Yeah. That's right. Zaf Rabban Gamliel Haya Baba Svina. Rabban Gamliel. Who's Rabban Gamliel to Rabbi Eliezer? His brother in law. Rabban Gamliel, who's the prince, he's the head of the Sanhedrin in Yavne. So even though the debate between the Sanhedrin and Rabbi uh, Eliezer was really between him and Rabbi Yoshua, correct? But at the end of the day, the head of the Sanhedrin who was there and presided over it was Rabban Gamliel. Zaf Rabban Gamliel Haya Baba Svina. Rabban Gamliel was traveling in the ocean at the time in a boat. A large wave came and was going to drown his ship. Amal. Rabban Gamliel, who's in this boat, and I don't know if it's a small boat, if it's a big ship, I have no idea what happens here, but it's a wave, and he realizes the wave is greater than usual. This is something that he feels is more than nature would have. Amal, Rabban Gamliel says, 
it appears to me, she'en ze'ela bishvil Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokanis, that this is happening to me. The ocean is attempting to drown me because of what I have done to Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokanis. Amad al Raglav Amar, he stands up on his feet and he says, Ribono Shonola, master of the universe. Galui v'yadu'a lefanecha. It is known to you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know the truth. Shelo l'chvodi asiti. I didn't do this to Rabbi Eliezer for my own honor. Not because of some petty political fight between the two of us. V'lo l'chvod bet Abba asiti. And I didn't do this for the sake of my family's, my father's pride, our, our kingdom, our royal lineage. I did this for your honor, HaKadosh Baruch Israel. So the Jewish people should not have too many arguments. We should decrease the arguments in the Jewish people. I mentioned to you last night, the point of the Sanhedrin here is to make everyone rally around one clear halakha. And you find here something fascinating. People for years, oh, why are you pushing Shukhan Aruch on everybody? It's very simple to me. It's very simple. I'm not pushing anything on anyone. It's just a mere, I'm pushing back on everybody who's pushing everything on everyone. But, why do I think there's value to all of us doing the same thing? Because our Chachamim clearly understand that machlokot in the Jewish people are a desecration of God's name. When someone comes from another religion, oh, what do you, ha- what do you guys do on Hanukkah? Well, the Jews from here, they do this, and the Jews from there, they do that, and the Jews are, and this guy is a Christian, he knows the Torah better than half the Jews I know. It says in the Torah, there's one law, one statute, one co- everything for, for you, for the citizen, for the stranger, for the, everybody. And then what do we tell him? We have 17 Torahs. Make sense to anybody? It's says, Rabban Gamliel, HaKadosh Baruch don't drown me now. You know that I didn't do this to hurt Rabbi Leza. You know that I did this to protect you. To protect your honor, HaKadosh Baruch So the Jewish people should be protected from needless arguments. Nachaya mizapo. At that moment, the ocean rests. It calms down. When I told you yesterday that I truly believed that the Sanhedrin were not picking on Rabbi Eliezer, they really believed that they were at a crossroads, that if they don't shut this down now, that this will be the end of it. When I told you yesterday what Rabbi Abe Faur shared with me, that here there's a crisis in the Jewish people. You have a rabbi who's coming and manipulating nature to prove his point in halakha. And our rabbis are concerned. What is going to happen when every rabbi, every rebbe, every admo, every baba, every wherever they come from, is going to, oh, I had a dream, and the dream told me, what happens when that's what Judaism becomes? By the way, you want to know what happens? Just look, that's what Judaism has become already. So you want to know what happens? Look. When everybody can have the, I had a dream speech of Rabbi Eliezer, then the Jewish world falls to pieces. You should know, I want to just say, that in that story, there's an interpretation that I read from Rabbi Dr. Benny Lau. I don't agree with everything Rabbi Benny Lau says. But he has very interesting insights. And here he explains that the war between Rabbi Yoshua and Rabban Gamliel, as I told you, was a war about tradition versus innovation. Do you remember that moment? Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua are arguing. And Rabbi Yoshua, he says, the Rebbe says, if the walls of the Bedim, if I'm right, the walls of the Bedim Lash collapse and they stop halfway, why does they stop? Because Rabbi Yoshua says, what are you guys getting involved for? Rabbi Yoshua's whole attitude is that the halakha is not, doesn't belong in any building. There's no objective, closed off, rigid, static halakha in any place. The walls of the Ben Midrash are just a place. You don't have the right to get involved in the deliberations of rabbis who are innovating to keep the Jewish people alive. Rabbi Eliezer, he resorts to nature, to Kadosh Baruch Hu's realm, to show, listen, I know that you think rabbis are so great. I know that you think the power of innovation is so important. But I need you to look up and see beyond that and to realize that I represent an unbroken chain of divine teachings. And here there's really a battle between the the wall, the static, the this is the way we always do things, to the new dynamic, innovative Sanhedrin of Rabban uh, Rabbi Yoshua and Rabban Gamliel. So here, Rabban Gamliel is showing you his real self. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know that I don't have anything against Rabban Rabbi Yoshua, but I had to do this for you. And that brings us to the next story. 
Ima Shalom. Remember who Ima Shalom is? Debitu de Rabbi Eliezer. She is the wife of Rabbi Eliezer. By the way, it's very important to know that our Chachamim always referred to their wives as either their daughter, Biti, or Beti, my home. There's a certain connection between Chachamim and their spouse and the understanding that their spouse is their world. It's something that there's some stories of Hillel and Zakan I'm thinking of. One day, Hillel, the way he speaks to his wife. Where do you see the lifestyle, the way of life of women when you study them? Absolutely. It's very different than do this, don't do that, don't do that. I had a, a young kid in my car this week and I asked him, What are you guys studying in school? Oh, Talmud. What are you studying in Talmud? Laws of damages. Which laws of damage? Oh, if an ox gores this right. one and that one, I'm telling myself. You know, um, there's room for that. There's room. But in sixth grade, I want my kids to know how to think and walk and talk like Rabban Gamir, like Hina, like Shammai, like, like Ravina, Ravashi, like uh, Rabbi Meir Balhanes. I want them to live this life. And the problem is the study of Agadah is almost entirely neglected by the world of Torah today. I'm not even telling you that you have to sit down here Kabbalistically interpreting the Talmud, but simply to read the Talmud as this is, this is the, these are the real stories of our real Chachamim who live real lives that we are doing our best to emulate. And what happens when you divorce Jewish tradition that were written by these rabbis from the way in which they live their life, the culture in which they live their life, the mentality with which they live their life in, then you have a Judaism that is divorced. Forget from the context of the Torah and the Bible and the land of Israel. It's a divorce from the people who wrote it. <laughs> Zev, you said it. I didn't say anything. So, <laughs> Ima Shalom. Ima Shalom, the wife of Rabbi Eliezer. Achte de Rabban Gamniel Havai. She was the sister of Rabban Gamniel. Mehahu ma'aseh ve'elach. From this moment onwards, lo havat shafkat le'el Rabbi Eliezer le'bepal al apeh. She did not allow her husband, Rabbi Eliezer, to fall on his face. What is falling on your face? Tachanun, very good. Tachanun. What is Tachanun? It's a supplication, it's a prayer. We re- tachanun is a prayer we say every day, asking forgiveness. So how do we do it? We fall down on our face. Why do we fall on our face? Because this is an action of how we pray. Um, remember when Esther Malka comes to Hashverosh and she falls down on his knees and she cries and she begs him. This you should find in the Tanakh also, they fall down in front of the, the enemy and they this is a certain out of begging for something. We beg forgiveness from how do we beg forgiveness? Not by standing up straight, but going down. What kind of down? We'd fall on our face. So if it was on the floor of Mamash or on the table, like when you, you know we see some of their so they're so devastated, they fall like that. Now, Savaradim don't do Nifilat Abayim anymore for the most part. Why? There's a Kabbalistic tradition that has influenced the rest of the Sephardic community that Nifilat Apayim, if you don't have the right kavanah, the right intentions when doing Nifilat Apayim, you can cause tremendous damage to yourself. And so because of that, the Sephardic Mekubalim stopped doing Nifilat Apayim. The Ashkenazim, what did they do? Also influenced by Kabbalah, what did they do? They just switched out the psalm. So they say the wrong Tachanun every day. Because that way they're not having any kavanah, meaning... That's one way to fix the problem, right? One way is not to do Tachanun. The other way is to just skip the thing entirely and say a different prayer. The Hasidim, they get the best of both worlds. What they do is they say the right Tehillim, but also they put their head down, which means that if there's any kind of damage happening, according to the Mekumalim, it's geared to that world, okay? Now, how do you do Tachanun? You see in an Ashkenazi place, they do Tachanun. Do you do it on your right hand or your left hand? Okay, so there's, there are two traditions of the Jewish people. Whether you do it on your left hand when you have tefillin or not. I believe Rav Saad Yagon believed on your left hand even with tefillin. I believe the Yemenites, that's what they do, though I'm not sure. It's been a long time since I prayed that way. They, but for the most part, they switch hands. So they're not laying on their tefillin. But let's say, the Tachanun that Ashkenazim do is supposed to look something like this. At least, like this. What do they do now? I see, because I go often to pray and, like this. Or even I've seen people do this. What are you doing? Are you checking your temperature? Your, I don't know, what, what is when you if nifilat apayim is falling on your face? The hand has very little to do with it. Yeah, it it's it's what you're leaning on practically, but but you don't you don't need to do. And when you see people do things like this, it makes you realize that they have no understanding at all of what it is they're doing. So when regular ignoramuses do it, fine. You go to a better knesset. You see the rabbi of the community. 
it makes you wonder, makes you wonder, are they even aware of what it is they're doing? And if you're not aware, so why are you doing it? Why are you teaching other people to do it this way? So here, she knows that this tefillah, tachanun, is very powerful. Tefillah tapayim is a very, it's a way, there are even some restrictions of Talmidei Chachamim doing tefillah tapayim, for fear that if a Talmidei Chacham does tefillah tapayim and he's not answered, then people will suspect that he's not a real Talmidei Chacham because his tefillah tapayim didn't work. So, She's afraid of him doing Nifilat Tafayim. Why is she afraid of him doing Nifilat Tafayim? What is she afraid he's going to ask for? The who should die? The who should die? Oh, her brother. Because well, even Shalom knows that uh, her husband is so sad and angry about the whole incident that if he would like pray to God um, and pour out his heart before God, that God might punish her brother. Very good. Very good. So she was afraid. She, she was afraid, very good, that her, her husband would pray that her brother should die. And now she's stuck between two people that she loves, her husband and her brother, both who are at literal war with each other. You know, this whole separation of, of I don't know how much I can tell you one day. The whole separation of the rabbis, one from another. If you remember the story of Pesach, that the rabbis were sitting down together and that they were discussing the redemption of Mitzrayim at night. He says, Rabbi Al-Azhar ben Arach says, I never, my whole, I didn't merit in all my years to merit the understanding of Yitzhak Mitzrayim by Lot until today. This whole story is happening. The Chachamim are sitting in Bnei Brak. They're sitting elsewhere from where they should be sitting. These are early rifts that exist in the Jewish community. The authors of the Haggadah are harnessing one camp's beliefs while ignoring other camps that exist. There's a lot that's going on in this generation. For right now, you have a woman who's caught between two people that she loves that are engaged in a world war, at least in the Jewish community. And she does not want her husband to do Nifat Apayim because she doesn't want her brother to die. That's very, it's very simple. She's afraid. that She knows Rebbe will be answered. That when he could make water flow backwards and trees fly out of the ground, there's no problem for him to get her, her brother killed. How Yoma... It was one day, and it was Rosh Chodesh. And she substituted, meaning in her mind she got confused. There are some Rosh Chodesh that have two days and one that have one day. She got confused. She thought that today was going to be Rosh Chodesh, but really it was only a one day Rosh Chodesh, and she missed the day. It was a day earlier. Whatever it was, her calculation was off. What does it make a difference that it was Rosh Chodesh? On Rosh Chodesh, you don't do nifilat apayim. You don't do that prayer. So she figured she doesn't have to watch her husband today because he can't pray that way anyway. So her brother is safe for today. She, she took her eye away from Rabbi Eliezer. So what happens? Ikadami, there's some who say, Ata anya v'kaya baba, afik ale rifta. Some say that there was a poor person who came to the door and she went over to the door to give him some bread. Meaning she was taking care of a poor person. And for that moment, it wasn't Rosh Chodesh, it was a different story, but for whatever reason she was not supervising Rabbi Eliezer on that day. Why is Rabbi Eliezer at home? Where else is he going to pray? Rabbi Eliezer is home. Because he can't go anywhere. Because he's been shut down. She saw that he was doing Nifilat Apayim. Amrale, she tells him, Kum, get up, kitaltele achi. Kill up, get up before you kill my brother. Or, you already killed my brother. In that moment, the shofar came out of the house of Rabban Gamliel, notifying everybody that Rabban Gamliel had died. Amarla, he said to her, How did you know that your brother was dead? She told him, This is the tradition that I received from the house of the father of my father. All of the gates in the world of prayer are locked. Kadosh doesn't answer anyone's prayers. But there's one gate that's not locked. That's the gate of Ona'a, of a person who's been mistreated, a person who's been hurt, and they pray. Kadosh Baruch always answers that prayer. Correct, but it seems that he prayed 
so much about his suffering that the Kadosh Baruch Hu answered his prayer. Here, here you have the Gemara sharing with you that Ima Shalom tells Ban Gamliel, listen, you might have done everything right in your world of Hacha, but in your world of interpersonal relationships, what you have done to my husband is character assassination. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu, he doesn't let such things go. It's nice that you got yourself saved on that ship, but it's not going to last forever. That saving yourself on a ship, Kadir Bukhu says you're right. But at the end of the day, there's someone who's living in suffering. And the Talmud Bavli leaves us off with this taste in our mouth that all is not well in the world of Rabban Gamliel. All is not well in the world of Rabbi Eliezer. This isn't a happily lived after, ever, happily ever after story. This is a story that ends tragically. Tragically for Rabban Gamliel, but just because Rabban Gamliel is dead, it doesn't mean the suffering of Rabbi Eliezer is over. In fact, it's far from over. It's, it's far from over. It's an impossible situation because Rabbi Gamliel has to do the right thing. And he believes in God. And he does feel the pain. And uh, Rabbi Eliezer had to stand up for what he believed. It's like... You're stuck, the... you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Exactly like that. Yitzchak, I think there's extra batteries in here. A person violates when they cause a convert suffering in Halakha, uh, which is connected to all this. I will tell you that very often I've found in situations in which I observe ona'a, suffering of gerim. There's no other word for that. Suffering of gerim that are caused by the Jewish people, not just by clergy. By clergy for sure. By the conversion authorities, absolutely. But even by regular Jewish folk who are absolute ignoramuses in the laws of conversion or how to accept people who've given up everything in their life to join Am Yisrael. Those people should not think for one moment that just because they thought they were doing the right thing, that Hakadosh Baruch Hu will let them off the hook. Mikubalani mi bet avi Abba, Ima Shalom I already have a tradition from my parents, grandparents, that all of the gates are locked except for the gates of mistreating a fellow Jew, and it could be, it could be that that suffering. You think, oh, they're not even Jewish; it's not a conversion. You might think all of your, I know your people, need. but listen. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't have a chief rabbinate blacklist that he looks at for whose girim are good and whose are not. You're oppressing somebody who's your brother, your sister, your, your family. HaKadosh Baruch Hu certainly, certainly has time and place. There's a time and place for everything under the sun. I want to talk with you a little bit more. If it's okay with you. <laughs> if it's okay, we can call it a night too now. What are you guys feeling? You go till 10 o'clock? It's okay. Yes? That's because you have Ima to nap on. I want to look with you in a Mishnah. Okay? Uh, this Mishnah, we're going to find it. Go to Safaria. I'll help you find it. Go to Safaria. Click Mishnah. You're going to scroll down to Seder. Taharot, it says Taharot, okay. Taharot, you're going to click on Yadayim, you see Yadayim, okay, so Mishnah, Taharot, Yadayim, and then you're going to go to chapter 4, I'll pull up my Mishnah. Go to chapter... Oh, it's not loading well, huh? Okay. At all. Mine is working. Let me close the app and try over. Boba Yomamu. Every Mishnah here starts with Bova Yomamu, Bova Yomamu. On that day they said, on that day they said, which day? What are we talking about here? Do you remember the story here? Chapter 4. Abba, you're with us? No, Bova Yom. Every time you find the Mishnah, every time you find the Mishnah on that day, which day? This one 
on the day that uh, Rabbi Gamliel was excommunicated. This is the day, Bovayom, in which Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah became the Rosh Hashiva because Rabban Gamliel was. You remember there's a famous war in the Beladin. We didn't get to the stories yet. In which temporarily Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah becomes the Rosh Hashiva. He opens up the doors of the Beda Midrash. He allows everybody to come in and study. Remember this? All the halachot that were taught on that day start with Bovayom, on that day. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of halachot that if it wasn't for Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah opening the Beda Midrash, Rabbi Lazar ben Arach. No, why am I telling you Rabbi Lazar ben Arach? No, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah. When he became the Rosh Shiva in Yavne, when he became the Rosh Shiva in Yavne, that, that's when all the halachot were taught in this halakha, in Mishnah number, chapter 4, Mishnah 3. So look, chapter 4, Mishnah 3. Uh, it's really not relevant to us, the whole conversation. What is the law of Amon Moav, the lands that were Amon Moav, on the sabbatical year, when it comes to Shemitah, the seventh year? So what goes on with them? There's a question. As you know, that every year different um, uh, tithes are taken. There's Maser Rishon, Maser Shani, there's Maser Anim, there's uh, all, kind, uh, there are all kinds of tithes that are taken in different places. And there breaks out a war in the Ben Midrash. Gazar Bitafon, Maser Ani, the Gazar Bilazar Ben Azariah, Maser Shani. They are debating which one. Amar Rabbi Shmel, Rabbi Shmel says, El Azar Ben Azariah. You must teach your proof for your requirement. Because you are being strict in halakha. Listen to this rule of the Mishnah. Anyone who rules stringently in halakha, the burden of proof is on them. Not on those who are acting leniently. Where does this come from? There's a law in the laws of uh, property. That if I say... Zev, nice uh, scarf. It's mine. He says, what are you talking about? It's my scarf. Do you want? I, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm sure Zev would let me borrow his scarf. <laughs> but let's say I say, I'm going to sue Zev and the Bedadin. We go to the Bedadin, and he comes with this scarf. And I say, listen, guys, that scarf is mine. My wife bought it for me last year at Hanukkah. And the Bedadin is going to ask Zev, Zev, do you have a receipt to prove that it's yours? Or that you can ask him that question? Who are they going to ask to prove that it's mine? Me. I'm the one saying that Zev's scarf belongs to me. So I'm the one who has to prove that that belongs to me. He doesn't have to prove anything. He's the one wearing the scarf. When you come to tell people, oh, you're not allowed to do that anymore in Halakha. Good for you. It's nice of you to tell me that. But you have to bring a proof. I don't have to prove why I'm doing it. You have to prove why you're making me not do it. You're taking away something from me. This mentality, by the way, is forgotten completely in the realm of halakha as we know it today. Today, everybody is more stringent than the next one. They don't have to bring proof to anything. I, I recently got a book on the laws of kashrut. There's not one footnote in the whole book. Not one footnote in the whole book. You think one. Not one. Doesn't have to. Why does he have to? He's telling you everything's not allowed. And who has to prove? I have to prove. I got an email from a rabbi in Los Angeles about nine years ago. A dayan of sorts. Self-proclaimed. And... Uh, this Dayan told me, Rabbi Halevi, you must cease and desist from teaching the laws of Pesach because you are saying many things that are wrong and especially for Svaradim, they're wrong. Something like that. And I wrote back to him, Rabbi so-and-so, please send an email to Marlene. She'll be more than happy to send you a copy of my book. After you've read my book and the hundreds of footnotes in my book, you're welcome to write a book back and I'll respond in kind with another book. But until then, leave me alone. You want to argue, argue. I brought a proof to everything that I say. You don't like it. You could tell me. You just can't call me though and threaten me or send me an email and threaten me. You're welcome to engage in halakhah, but you can't. Uh, you're coming to take away things from Am Yisrael. You've decided orange juice without a special P on the label is chametz. Well, that's good for you. You have to prove that to be the case. You can't expect all of us to listen to you. Now this war goes on. It rages in the Bede Midrash. Skip to the end of the halakhah. We don't have to go through all of this back and forth. Uh, somewhere towards the end, you'll see. Like scroll, it's, it's maybe the last few lines of the Mishnah. I'm in a different setup than you, so I can't tell you exactly where you'll find it. Towards the end. And when Rabbi Yosef ben Durmaskit, who was in the Bedemidash at this time, 
depending on how big your screen is. Yes? Rabbi Yosef ben Dur Maskit, that said Rabbi Eliezer ben Lud. When Rabbi Yosef ben Dur Maskit, he comes to visit Rabbi Eliezer in Lud. Amar lo, Rabbi Eliezer tells him, Ma chidush haya lachem bebet midrash hayom? Which chidush, which new insight did you learn in the Bet Midrash today? I've told you already yesterday that this could even be a little bit of a, um, a, a, a stinging remark. Tell me in your new Sanhedrin with all your new rules, which new rule did you learn today in the Halakha? Amar lo, he tells him, Rabbi Yosef, Nimnu v'gamru, they took a vote on Halakha. Amon u'mo'av, ma'asari ma'aser ani b'shavit. That Amon u'mo'av and those lands, they take the poor man's tithe on the seventh year. But it seems that this is the case in order so that the poor people would have what to eat during Shavit. But they took a vote in the Sanhedrin. Where do you find the word Nimnu earlier? Where did we say they took a vote? About what? Right. They took a vote and they excommunicated Rabbi Eliezer. So now he's saying, oh, we were in the Bede Midash, we took a vote. And we decided that on the seventh year, in Ma'amun Mu'av, they have to take the poor man's tithe. Rabbi Yezer cries and he said, Sod Adonai Dereav Uvrito Lhodiam. This Pasuk says <coughs> that it's a, yeah, from Tilim that the secrets of Akadosh Bahu are given to those who fear him. He's speaking about the rabbis. I mean they came to the true conclusion, he says, because they're God fearing people. Tsevemorlehem, go and tell them. Al Tahushu Numin Yanchem. Stop being so worried that maybe you voted wrong. He's making fun of their voting. Like, your voting. Let's call it our voting. Your voting. I know that you guys are sending me Rabbi Yosef because you're not sure what the halakha is. Because you took a vote, but you're not even confident in your vote. Mikubal ani mirabban Yochanan ben Zakai. I have a tradition from Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai. Shishama mirabbo. That he heard from his rabbi. Verabo mirabbo. And his rabbi from his rabbi. Ad halakha la Moshe Mizinai. Until Moshe Rabbeinu on Mount Sinai. That your halakha is correct because that's what I heard from Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai who heard from his rabbi, who heard from his rabbi, who heard from Moshe Rabbeinu. By the way, there's a practical ramification if this really comes from Moshe Rabbeinu or not. Is it really in the category of halakha la Moshe Misinai or not? There's an argument among the commentaries of the Mishnah about that. So right now, let's pause and understand here. The Sanhedrin doesn't know the answer to a halakha question. And they decide instead to vote by matter of consensus. And they, they send this Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi Yosef comes on his own, however you want to understand, to kind of get a stamp of approval from Rabbi Eliezer. And they're afraid. They're not sure if they made the right decision. And what does Rabbi Eliezer tell them? Don't worry. Forget your methodology in halakha of counting votes. I know that you guys are right because I have a tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu that you're right. Where is this man with a tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu? The Rambam tells us not all agree, but I obviously read the Mishalik the Rambam. The Rambam tells us that this story took place after he was excommunicated from the Sanhedrin. And so here is a man who can answer the Sanhedrin's questions because he has a tradition from Moshe Rabbeinu. There are four other students of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai in the Sanhedrin, clearly who don't know the Halakha as well as he does. And he tells Rabbi Yosef, go back and tell them, they're okay, it's fine, don't worry. By the way, the Tosefta, has this story in a little bit of a different variation. In this variation, when Rabbi Eliezer asks and says, Machidush, yesh what did you learn today new in the Ben Midash? What Rabbi Yosef answers is, Oh, Rabbi, we're your students. We drink from your water. What's he trying to tell him? There's no Chidush in the Ben Midash, Rabbi, because you're not there with us. You're not there with us, so we're not learning anything new. He's trying to avoid the question. And Rabbi Eliezer still pushes him. No, tell me what the Chidush is. And he tells him the same exact thing. The Talmud Bavli has a little bit of a different variation of the story. If you click on this Mishnah and you click on Talmud, it will be one of the options Safaria gives you. So click on the Mishnah and then click where it says Talmud. It will take you to Masechet Chagigah. Do you see that? Follow the hyperlinks, they call them. Follow it to Chagigah. You see how you do that? You click Talmud. On the third one, Chagiga. On the third Mishnah, you should see Chagiga. It's an option.
Third. Yeah, third Mishnah. Click on it, find Talmud, and then it should say uh, Chagiga. Do you see that? Okay. So it says there, in the middle of uh, section six. There's a story about Rabbi Yosef ben Dur Maskit. So this is exactly the same story we have in our Mishnah we just read. That he went, and you see that in the Mishnah it says Lud, here it says Lod. He went to go greet Rabbi Yosef, meaning to go consult with him. He asks, Which new novel insight did you learn in the Bet Midrash? He tells him, Ninu v'gamu. The rabbis voted and instituted Amon Moav Maserin Maser Ani Bashavit. That they take the poor tithe in the seventh year in Amon Moav. Amarlo, he tells him, Yosef, Peshot Yadecha Vekabelet Enecha. This is a very, if one read it simply. Put out your hands, Rabbi Yosef, and get ready to catch your eyeballs. What? Put out your hands and get ready to catch your eyeballs. Pashat did that. He put out his hands. V'kibelitenav, and his eyes came out of their sockets and fell into his hands. By the way. It's a very long story. By the way, yes. I'm sure that there's an agadic way to read this as well. Something with his eyes, putting them in his hands. Yeah, not for now. Bachar Rabbi Eliezer, Eliezer, Vamar Rabbi Eliezer cries and he says, "Sod Adonai Lireav Ritol Hodiyam Amar Lo Lech Vemor Lehem Go and tell them Al Tachushu Lemin Yalchem Don't worry about your voting consensus. Kach Mekubelani Meribi Ochanan Ben Zakai Shishama Mirabo Verabo Mirabo I received from Rabbi Chaim Ben Zakai who heard from his rabbi who heard from his rabbi's rabbi. Halacha La Moshe Misinai." From Moshe Rabbeinu and Har Sinai, Amon Moav Maserin Maser Ani B'Shaviit. That in Amon Moav they take the tithe of the poor man in the seventh year. What time was the reason? Harbe Krachim Kavshu Ane Mitzrayim Shono Kavshu Ane Bavin Mipnei Shekidshu Harishona Kidshan Leshata Velo Kidshan Leati Davo Vinichum Kidshi Shismechu Ani Manehem B'Shaviit. That when they reconquered the land, they intentionally left these lands unconquered. So they could farm them and allow for the poor people to take the tithes in the year of Shemitah where they wouldn't have money or wouldn't have other opportunities to get produce. Tana, and the rabbis tell us, Did I skip a place in your Gemara? No? A rabbi says that after his mind settled, I mean after he calmed down, Amar, he said, I may be Hashem's will that Yosef's eyeballs should go back into their place. And they went back into their place. Here, I have to tell you that there are interpretations to what's going on with the eyes of Rabbi Yosef. But it's not relevant to our story here. I just want to read you another variation of the story, which it ends with a good ending of sorts. The tragedy that you have to appreciate and internalize until we learn next week on Monday is that the man, Rabbi Eliezer, who we threw out of the Sanhedrin yesterday, he's not a regular guy. He's not another Tami Chacham, you can live without him. He is the man who when other Chachamim don't know the Halakha and they have to choose to take a vote on Halakhot, he still remembers exactly what his rabbi told him and what his rabbi's rabbi told him, he can quote you Halakhot from Moshe Rabbeinu. We lost in Am Yisrael because we lost Rabbi Yisrael. But sometimes you lose in order to gain. I want this story to bother you because next week on Monday, Rabbi Yisrael is going to leave this world. And we're going to have to contend with Hawa Chacham, who's the only one in his generation. When he was alive, there was still an option to send people to him and randomly get information from him when necessary. What happens when he dies? And you realize that your life source is no longer here with you, 
and there's no one else to ask questions to. Meaning, you had the luxury of throwing him out. Today, he's gone. And today, you don't even have the luxury to throw him out. He's simply taken away from you for good. What do you do then? How do the Chachamim contend with his illness, with his passing? What happens afterwards? When Rabbi Eliezer dies, what happens to his teachings? What happens to his yeshiva? Do we allow ourselves to study his writings again? Because he's no longer with us anymore? Does that change the cherem that was on him? All of that we're going to discuss, God willing, next week, Monday and Tuesday.